Hello, this is Miss Nichols and I am here in my approximately 95 degree classroom at WHS while you guys are hopefully at home being comfortable and sipping iced tea or something. But in any case, um, together we're going to learn about fluids. This is the first video in the unit on fluids, introduction to fluids. And the essential question is what defines a fluid and why do we need an entire branch of physics just to study fluids? So the first thing we need to do is to understand how physicists define fluid. When you guys hear the word fluid, you're probably thinking mostly of liquids. But in terms of physics, fluids are materials that are either liquids or gases. So either that glass of orange juice or that steam that's coming off of your uh, cup of tea in the morning. The thing that characterizes fluids is that they have weak intermolecular bonds. This means that the molecules inside a fluid can actually move around relatively easy. They're not stuck to each other, and they will, generally speaking, take the shape of their container. On solids, obviously, those molecules are held in place by really strong rigid bonds, and one part of the solid can't migrate to the other part. Liquids still have some bonding. That's why we have surface tension. But um, those bonds are transitory and can be broken pretty easily, so the liquids can take the shape of the container. Gases basically have no intermolecular bonds at all, and they go everywhere in the container. Plasmas, um, we've taken a gas and broken it into its ions. Fluid physics actually would cover plasmas as well, although we don't actually do that in this class specifically. Um, but just so you know, all of those are defined as, as fluids. So why do we need an entire branch of physics dedicated to fluids? Well, when you first learn physics, you talk a lot about forces and how exerting a force on an object accelerates it, right? If we were in class together live, I'd go around class with this meter stick and probably accelerate a few of you guys and accelerate some of the stuff off your desks just because I'm kind of a jerk like that. But fluids are different. When you push on fluids, they don't accelerate the same way solids do, right? I could push this fluid all I want, bam, right at that camera, and it's not knocking over my computer, and it's not accelerating. Instead, the fluid is actually flowing out of the way of my, um, of my object. So we need an entirely new branch of physics to deal with it. F equals MA doesn't work anymore. Um, we need a, a new thing, fluid dynamics and fluid statics. As I previewed in that last slide, um, there are actually two different branches of fluid physics. The first is called fluid statics. And fluid statics means that the fluid system is not moving. That's what that word static means, staying still. So in other words, the system as a whole has a velocity of zero. It turns out the little particles inside that fluid are moving, right? Because that's the way it works as far as zooming into objects. But um, for every particle that's moving that direction, there's another one moving this direction. If I look at a bottle of fluid like this water, the bottle itself is not going anywhere. The fluid itself has a net velocity of zero. Example of a fluid static system would be a water tower. The water in there overall is not moving. The other kind of uh, fluid physics that we're going to be learning about is called fluid dynamics. And the word dynamic means moving. So in fluid dynamics, the overall system of the fluid actually is moving. It has a velocity that is not zero. For example, a hose. So before we get going too far into physics, we need to define some variables. Most of these you'll have heard of before, but it's always good to know what the precise physics definition is and what units and symbols and things we're going to use. So the first variable is volume, uh, capital V. I'm sure you use that in chemistry if you took chemistry. Uh, and if not, you probably saw it in middle school. The volume of a fluid is easy to calculate because since it fills the fluid, the container it's in, you can just calculate it based on the volume of the container. So it's back to a little bit of basic geometry. We have pretty simple containers in this class. Typically speaking, we've got um, you know, cube or rectangle cubes, uh, length with height, or we've got cylinders, pi r squared times the height, or occasionally we'll have a sphere, uh, which is 4 thirds pi r squared. Those equations are on the AP reference sheet, by the way. One little note, gases, of course, will fill 100% of container. So the entire container is the volume of the gas. If we're talking about a liquid, though, because of surface tension and because of gravity, they will sit at the bottom of the container. Uh, so you'll still use the length times the width or the area of the bottom of the container. But then, of course, your height is just the height of the liquid, not the height of the entire container. In physics, this is something a little different from chemistry. The standard unit of length is the meter in physics, which means the standard unit of volume is actually a meter cubed. That's huge, right? In chemistry, you're dealing with milliliters or cubic centimeters. Um, and in physics, 
all of our volumes to be in our SI units and to be compatible with the other units that we're used to need to be converted into meters cubed. Um, a little reminder, a cubic meter is 100 centimeters times 100 centimeters times another 100 centimeters. So we got to do 100 cubed centimeters cubed, um, which is a million cubic centimeters is equal to one cubic meter. The second important fluent variable is density, which is represented by the Greek symbol rho. Um, it kind of looks funny in the font that I have on there. I usually sort of draw it as a P, a single stroke P, but um, anyway, that's the letter rho in Greek. And density is defined as the kilograms of mass in every cubic meter of volume. So if I have a cubic meter of something, how many kilograms would that something weigh or have of mass. Uh, so the equation based on that definition is just rho equals m over v. That's just the definition of that, that unit, or that variable. Another way to look at this has to do with the relationships that you can see in that. Hopefully you remember relationships from freshman physics. Uh, because the mass is on the top of the fraction, density has a linear relationship with the mass of the material, which of course means if you something has double as much mass in the same volume, the density will double as well. Uh, and there's an inverse relationship with the volume, since that's on the denominator of that fraction, uh, which means that the bigger the volume gets while keeping mass constant, uh, the smaller the density gets by um, a reciprocal relationship. Density is a characteristic property of a material. That means that all common materials have typically a known density value. And often, if you have an unknown material, but you can figure out the density, you can reference a table to figure out what material you're talking about. So all of those materials have their own unique densities. For reference, the density of air is 1.225 kilograms per meter cubed. So if I had a meter cubed of air, that would have about a kilogram of mass, which is actually kind of a lot. Remember, a kilogram is the mass of a pineapple. So you know, a whole pineapple worth of air molecules are in uh, a meter cubed. Water, on the other hand, is really heavy, and it's got a density of 1,000 kilograms per meter cubed. So if I take a whole cubic meter of water, it's a really lot. It's 1,000 pineapples or 1,000 kilograms worth of mass. So in physics, as I sort of referenced above there, the standard unit of density is the kilogram per meter cubed. But on occasion, you're going to get weird things that are you know, given to you in grams per centimeter cubed, which is the, the standard unit in chemistry. So just be careful. Often, it doesn't matter that much so long as you're consistent across your calculations. Um, but just be cognizant, be aware of those units. So I have a little demo here I want to show you guys. Um, because probably you learned about density at middle school and you have some um, preconceived notions about what, how density relates to floating and sinking. And, and when you look at a column of materials like this, you probably have some ideas about how they compare with each other in terms of density. Maybe some of you are making predictions about which of these beads, for example, has more density than the other. Um, what's happening here with this fluid is kind of interesting because there's some on the top and some on the bottom. Um, so maybe you can come up with some theories or ideas about what's happening here. But whatever you think you think about this, um, let me shake it up a little bit and see if it still matches your predictions or what, what, you, what you thought going into it. Uh-oh, that's different. How strange. Somehow shaking that seemed to have changed something fundamental about it. Hmm. So I'll just sit here and be patient, see if anything else interesting happens. So at this point, I hope your brains are exploding just a little tiny bit. Um, I don't think there's very many people that know exactly what's going on with this the very first time they see it. Uh, and it should be something that really kind of gives you pause and makes you think about what you think you think about density and um, how the actions of the demo might affect it. 
I do promise you there have been no camera tricks or no shenanigans here. This is a bottle that's just sitting on my desk. And we will come back to this uh, a little bit later on, but I'm actually just going to leave that as a mystery for now. So the third fluid variable that we want to define is pressure, which is represented with a capital uppercase P. Pressure is defined as the amount of force that is exerted on a square meter of surface area. And the equation that comes out of that definition is pressure is equal to F over A. That equation shows that we have a linear relationship between pressure and force. So the higher the force, the higher the pressure. And an inverse relationship with area and pressure. So the lower the area, the higher the pressure. We like to do a demo in class where people touch hands. So go ahead and just do this in front of yourself. Put your hands together. Um, you'll feel some pressure, one hand on the other. Uh, the harder you push, right, the more pressure you feel. That's kind of self-explanatory, but increasing force increases pressure. If you double the force, you double the pressure. But the other way to increase the pressure is to change the area of contact. This is a lot of surface area. If you change it to a finger and then push, you're going to feel a lot more pressure um, even for the same amount of force because the area got really small, so the pressure goes up. This equation is... Uh, really relevant in the real world. It explains why we have sharp needles at doctor's office. It would be a real bummer to have a needle that was dull because of uh, the relationship between area and pressure. And it also explains why airplane windows are so small, because if they were bigger, the glass would have to resist a lot more force and it would be more likely to break. It also tells you what you should do if you happen to be on a frozen lake and break through the ice. You want to spread your body out over as much area and lay down, crawl across the ice as you possibly can so that you don't push as hard on any little piece of the lake. In physics, the standard unit of pressure is the Pascal, which is equal to a Newton per meter squared. Uh, force, of course, is measured in newtons, and area is measured in meters squared. So newton per meter squared is the same as one pascal. So before we finish with this, I want to run you through one big practice problem based on a fun fact. Fun fact, person wearing high heels exerts more pressure on the ground than an elephant does. But the question is, how much pressure would an elephant wearing high heels exert on the ground? Let's assume the elephant's density is roughly 1,100 kilograms per meters cubed, which is just more than water. Her volume is 4 cubic meters, and the footprint of each shoe is 0 0.01 meters squared. So I would pause this video, try solving the problem, grab your calculator, uh, and then if you get stuck, you can come back and listen through the steps as I give my solution. Step one, find the mass of the elephant using the density equation. So we're going to use density and volume to calculate the mass. We end up getting 4,400 kilograms for the mass of the elephant. Step two is to calculate the force of gravity, because that's the force that we're actually going to be pushing down on the Earth through the high heels. And gravity is equal to the strength of the gravitational force field on Earth, which is 10, times the mass of the object, which gives us uh, 44,000 newtons of gravitational force. And then the last step is to find pressure using the pressure equation. Don't forget to divide your answer by four at the end because there's four shoes. So I got 1,100,000 pascals per shoe. Better be strong shoes. All right, we've come to the end of this video. Please revisit the essential question, which is what defines a fluid and why do we need a whole new branch of physics to study fluids? Hopefully you guys have some sense now um, of what makes a fluid kind of unique and different and uh, why we need these new variables. Thanks for watching.